Ashley. And this is Kristen. And this is a thousand miles of true crime. So welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be finishing up the Betty Broderick story today. So we're going to get into some of those juicy details and we're going to hear about the actual murder. But before we do that, Kristen, how's your week been going? It's been busy. I'm about to start preparing for my son's baby shower. I'm going to be a grandma come the end of uh, February, beginning of March. So just preparing for that and, you know, a bunch of activities that my youngest son is in for baseball and basketball. But outside of that, everything else has been pretty chill. How about you? What's going on on your side of the world? Hold on. Are we just, well, first of all, congratulations, but I like how you act like, oh, it's a chill week, (laughs) except for all that other stuff. So (laughs) yeah, so I'm going to be a grandma. I'm excited. I'm a young grandma. I was a young mom, but, um, I have like no issues. There's no anger of like my 22 year old son, you know, going into fatherhood. I'm, I'm going to stand behind him and be as supportive as I can. And yeah, I'm, I'm totally looking forward to it. Well, I'm really excited for you. I know you're going to be such a I almost said a great grandma. That doesn't sound right. No, we <laughs> don't want to speak that. Yeah. No. <laughs> but you will be a great grandma. <laughs> I can do it. Super mom. So I know you're going to be even better grandma. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> so Ashley, what's going on on your side of the world? How's your well, week been? I've had a pretty exciting week. I flew to LA and, uh, we were, well, we were celebrating my boyfriend's birthday there, but I got to drive to San Diego and see some, a very close friend of mine that I work with every day, but, and we talk all the time, but I've never gotten to meet her actually. So after like two and a half years of constant contact, we got to finally meet and I stayed at her house and it was awesome. And our kids got to play together And she had a really big surprise for me. And she took me to the Dan Broderick murder house. Oh my God. Oh, so this is a really good friend. Cause you know, not everybody is in the true crime like us. So for your friend to have like really done that for you and taking you somewhere where you, she knew you were going to be totally interested is that's a good friend right there. Yeah. I mean, it, she's not into true crime at all either. So I, it's almost like that extra level. And she surprised me. I mean, we were like driving through a suburb and she was telling me, she's like, I don't know if you're going to think this is really lame or really cool. And to be honest, I thought we were going to meet her mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we like pull up and like, I'm in shock. She's like, guess where we're at. And, um, it was just really cool to stand in front of the house and it is not like a tourist trap. People were looking at me like I was crazy. Uh, there was definitely people living there and they were like doing work. There was a dumpster outside the house. So, uh, <laughs> but it's just an extra layer to get me even closer to the story. And, um, I will put the pictures up on our Instagram, but again, it was just so cool to be there. So thank you. I'm not going to name you, uh, unless you give me permission to, but I really appreciated my trip and I hope you guys enjoy the pictures. That's awesome. That's awesome. When you guys rolled up, did you recognize where you were at or were you like, did it take you a second? Like, are you serious? Well, so we were, so we were, first of all, we were coming down the street and I'm going to be honest, like the houses were getting nicer and nicer and nicer. So this was no joke. This was a very nice house. Uh, So we pull up in front of it. And my very first thought was like, where do I know this house from? Like, I knew I knew the house right away. And before I could even like put two and two together, she, she told me what it was. And I think if I had gotten even like another 30 seconds, I would have picked up on it, but (laughs) It was just such a surprise because again, she's like not into true crime at all. And I, I have been obsessed with this case and talking about it a lot, but I did not expect her to actually surprise me and take me there. That's a good friend. She's a keeper. I like, I like her already (laughs) and I don't know her. So that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm like, well, we have to just plan a trip out to San Diego. (laughs) Do you want to go ahead and recap for everybody what happened in the first Yeah. Yeah. So like we started off, we were talking about Betty and Dan and like their past of them falling in love, them getting married. And then 
them just immediately jumping into parenthood, having kids. Betty supported the family while Dan was going to medical school and he, he was going to Cornell at the time. And then he decided he wanted more schooling and more education and went to law school at Harvard. Dan is also like now done with school at this point. And they moved to San Diego. He's accepted a job at one of the biggest law firms in the area. And now they're building their lives. Dan's opens up this lavish law firm. And that's when things, uh, that's when they really actually started making a lot of money. So, yeah, you know what I forgot to say at this point, he wasn't even taking cases unless they were guaranteeing a million dollar settlement. That's next level money. Like that's ridiculous. And with that, they decided to start buying properties, uh, more furniture, expensive clothing, and like living this glamorous lifestyle. That all ended once Dan fell in love with his 22-year-old receptionist, Linda Coquina. No matter what Betty did, Dan didn't want her. And he just told her, basically, I'm, I'm out. I'm leaving. And I can't remember if there's anything else. Did I forget anything? No, I think you got everything. You know what? I did just learn another fun fact though, that I'll throw in. So do you remember the, I hate Monday shooter? Do you know what I'm talking about? This, it was a girl who went to her school. She was 16 and it was a school shooting. And when the cops asked her why she did it, she said, I don't know. I hate Mondays. I don't remember this. I don't remember this. Okay. Well, let's add Brenda Spencer to the list. Uh, Cause that's a crazy story. But um, he actually, so Dan Broderick, he represented one of the family members that were part of the lawsuit. So that was one of the ways it kind of catapulted him and got his name in the news and, you know, just helped him become an even bigger lawyer. Wow. Fun fact, right? Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, they just, <laughs> so the his true crime cases just keep adding up. Yeah. His claim to fame before his own demise was the Monday school shooter. Wow. The I hate Monday school shooter. It's crazy. <laughs> so let's get started. So even though Dan moved out, he was still showing up all the time. So we're at the point where he's like, I'm not saying I want to get a divorce. I'm just saying I need time. And he's showing up at the house and, you know, being real nice to Betty. Let's be real. He's like still getting some from Betty and he's getting in her head and she's really thinking like, maybe we have a chance maybe we really are going to get back together. So during this time that he's being all lovey dovey and keeping her not in the loop of what's really going on, he is hiding money. He's giving his brother large amounts of money and he's buying all these properties that Betty's going to be in. She's going to have to actually pay for and be charged for in the divorce, even though she doesn't know any of this is going on and she thinks everything's going smoothly. So there's even evidence that Dan was paying for an apartment for Linda for like, for a while, for several years, he's putting her up in this, an apartment. I mean, I don't think it was super nice, but no matter what, it was a free apartment. Betty's still convinced he's just going through a midlife crisis. He's going to come back. And he is obviously making other plans. So at this point he goes ahead and he actually files for divorce. I mean, we've already talked about it, obviously Dan's a lawyer and he's a really good lawyer. So this is obviously going to be a really big challenge for Betty. Not only is he a great lawyer around this time, he becomes the head of the bar association in San Diego. So if you can imagine, people aren't really excited about going against him in court. He is, I mean, he's wealthy, he's powerful. He's got all these connections. What does Betty have? This is going to make it almost impossible for her to win, but it is going to make for a really nasty, messy divorce. And it's going to lead to national publicity. So I remember this being a crazy divorce, but like learning more of the details and the facts, Dan was plotting the entire time. Once Linda Coquina came into the picture, it's almost like he was just setting himself up setting himself up to basically be really, really wealthy, really, really successful. And it wasn't bad enough that he was about to basically destroy his family by leaving his wife and kids. But on top of that, like he wanted Betty to be miserable. Like he wanted to put her under strain 
And that's so obvious. I, I mean, how long did the divorce actually last? Like, was it, I mean, was it like ridiculously long and drawn out or like, what's the, the content behind there? Well, I mean, it depends. Do you think four years is a long time? Um, yeah, four yeah. years. Ooh, four years. So is that because Betty dragged it out or is that because Dan was just, I don't know, like, like who, who, why was it four years here? Let me start to get into some of that. But I mean, it was very (laughs) strategic. Everything that he was doing was planned and calculated. And that was before the divorce, during the divorce and after the divorce. The thing that really struck me right away was how he weaponized the word crazy. I mean, think about it. What do you do when somebody calls you crazy. The first thing you do is get really compliant. You try to show like, I'm not crazy. And then if someone keeps calling you crazy, eventually you just kind of go crazy, you know? And that's really what happened here. So at this point, you know, she's, she's going crazy and she's starting to even be abusive to the children. And she starts doing things that aren't only just crazy, they're illegal. And at this point, Dan ends up getting full custody of the children that would have probably made anybody in their right mind lose it. And Betty was already halfway gone, you know, like she's going through all this stuff. Her husband's leaving her, you know, her, her self-esteem is just completely probably just destroyed. And, you know, was Betty a good mom? I mean, how did she lose all custody? Betty wasn't thinking like a lawyer. I mean, obviously she's being very emotional. I think at this point she, I mean, her children are sort of her identity and they've been taken away from her, but she really kind of led to them being taken away. So Betty decided, you know, she kind of lost it with the kids. She was tired with them. She was, she felt like, Hey, I'm going to let Dan see what it's like to try to raise all of these kids. So this actually started with Kim, her oldest daughter, And so her oldest daughter, Kim comes home one day and is like, Hey, can you give my friend a ride home? And Betty is livid. She's like, I do so much for you. You're so ungrateful. I'm done. Pack your shit up. You're going to your dad's. And she leaves Kim on the porch sitting there and Dan's not even home. Like for all she knew, Dan was out of town. Like luckily Dan got home later that night, but Kim had been sitting there for hours, just waiting. And, you know, it's not now where you can just like text your dad and be like, when are you coming home? I mean, she was just stuck there with her stuff. And she was there for a couple of weeks before Betty pulled the same thing with her son, Dan. Um, she just left him there one night and he had to wait until somebody got home to let him in. So she just literally just left her kids there on the porch. Like just, just bye. Like, No, she didn't even let Dan know, Hey, I'm dropping the kids off. I'm not dealing with this today. She was just dropped them off and leave. Just dropped them off and left. Didn't call him. These are minors. These are minors. And at first it's the two, I mean, it's not even the two oldest because it's the oldest daughter. So she's a teenager. I mean, I can see you're kind of, you're frustrated. You're like, you know, just, just go to your dad's kind of thing. But she did do it to all the kids. And it's also I mean, I agree that it was probably some of it was like, you know, here, Dan, you figure it out. But the fact that it wasn't like she just came to that conclusion one day and dropped all four of them off. I mean, she was just really getting frustrated with the kids and was like, go, go to your dad. I don't think it was even a thought in his mind to even fight for custody, to be honest, until she did that. And it's really sad with the young, with the the last two that she dropped off too, because her daughter Lee was really upset because she was really close to her mom. And, you know, she remembers crying and saying like, I don't want to go live with dad, you know, Betty just saying like, go. And then the rat, the youngest son, I mean, he was still, I think he was like five or six at this time. So he was really upset. He wanted to stay with his mom. He's crying. He doesn't want to be left there. And Betty's just like, no, you need to go with your dad. He needs, he needs to learn his lesson. I think what she really didn't think about was, you know, First of all, Dan's a lawyer. I mean, he, he jumped on this. This was like an amazing chance for him. He's like, so you want to abandon your kids? I mean, and that's really how he played it. He got an emergency order and, you know, just destroyed her in court. So, I mean, it's neglect, essentially (laughs) it's neglect on Betty's part. So she did it to herself, but she did it with, I guess, an ulterior motive of 
trying to get Dan to wake up like, dude, you're not just going to leave me with these kids and you're not going to just like go off with this young girl and I'm stuck with all the hard stuff. She probably like, I mean, it, at this point, it sounds like pettiness, insert pettiness here, you know, I'm, yeah, I think I'm it's, checking out. It's insert pettiness. And it's just like, it is very narcissistic. You're just not even thinking about your kids. That's part of it. I think the other part is that she thought that Dan was going to come like crawling back to her and be like, Oh my God, you're right. This is so hard. I need you. What she forgot is that, you know, Dan's making like more money than God right now. So he's just like, (laughs) you know, bring in the nannies, bring in the maid, bring in the cook, like bring in the tutor, whatever you need, bring in the psychologist. So he, he really does all this and he just starts paying basically. I mean, the way she feels is he's just paying for all these people to raise his kids. Um, how he feels is like, I can have it all. Goodbye, Betty. So then at this point now, how, Betty's lost her kids. Her husband's left her now. Like what, what happens next? So the kids are living there and she's calling all the time and she's leaving all of these messages on the answering machine. And you know, they're crazy. It starts with just like, pick up, pick up. I know you're there. And it really starts to escalate. And she's, you know, really violent. She's swearing constantly. You know, she's like calling her, you know, Dan, her, her kids are hearing her call their dad an asshole constantly and things like this. But it really escalated when Linda recorded um, the answering machine message on the kids' phones. I do think this shows that at least at some level, Linda was provoking Betty. The part that I think just really takes it to another level is that it was on the kid's phone. Wait a second. She was, she was calling the kid's phone. Yeah. So do you remember house phones? Of course. Yeah. So, uh, I guess rich people, I don't know. I didn't have this at least would get multiple lines. Like you don't want your 16 year old daughter on your phone constantly. So you get them their own phone line. Okay. I remember that. Like it would like make a, a, a beep or like a tone and then you could click over. No, not like call waiting. It's like two full separate phone lines. Two separate oh my God. Lines. So, okay. yeah. So I, again, I, I, this isn't something I had, but they're, they're at a different level than we're at. We can fit that. <laughs> clearly. Right. Yeah. So uh, I think when I kind of, when I really dug in and found that out, that uh, to me really, like I said, it took it to another level because why would she, why would Linda need to record that message? You know what I mean? Like it's the kid's phone. Who's calling that? Like their friends and Betty, like she, I, she knew what she was doing when she recorded that message. Yeah. She's, she's, I, I think Dan and Linda were both trying to trigger Betty like to have a reaction and Dan he's been married to this woman for years. So he knows how to push her buttons. And he probably was like, Linda, you know what? I think it's a good idea. You go ahead and you leave that recorded message on that phone and let's see what Betty does. <laughs> let's see and how then bad too, this like it wasn't just, you know, I mean, there was, there was motive behind that too, because the messages she was leaving, you've listened to them, right? Like you've listened to some of them, right? I've listened to a lot of them and they, they're crazy. I mean, they get violent and she threatens to kill them constantly. She says, I mean, she's just trying to make them understand how mad she is like through these messages. And at some point, a, like the judge actually says, like, get your girlfriend off the answering machine. Cause it's provoking her that much. And her friends are telling her like, like, why are you leaving all these messages? Like you, this is actually getting you in trouble stop leaving the messages. And like, she's confused why they're asking her. She's like, well, how else am I supposed to let them know I'm angry? You know, I think everybody got the point, but Betty wanted them to suffer a little more. So at this point, they're probably wishing she would just stay on the phone because she starts showing up to the house and starts vandalizing it. So my gosh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, she really, and she used to live here. So she's, I mean, she feels very comfortable just walking in. And at one point she uh, breaks into the house and she like destroys all the Christmas presents 
And so it's around Christmas, the tree is up and everything. And she's destroying presents. She would go in and she would spray paint the walls and, you know, just do, do like actual damage. And then at one point she goes over there and she sees that there's this Boston cream pie sitting there. And she's like, the kids don't think about, they don't think twice about it. And her son's like, oh yeah, Linda made that for dad. And Betty like flips out. She grabs the pie, takes it up to his room and smart starts smearing it all over his bed. And it's again, his nice suits. She loves to attack the suits and gets it all over. And actually she goes on later. She'll go on Oprah a bunch of times and this gets brought up and somehow like Oprah says, well, like, didn't you bring a pie there and destroy his house? And she pauses and she smirks and she says, I didn't bring the pie. Linda did. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh so my she, gosh. She's still very, very bitter. What does Dan do? He goes, he requests restraining orders. She's not allowed near the house. She still has visit, visitation with the kids, but she's not allowed in the house when she comes and gets them. On January 30th, 1989, Dan was able to get a bifurcated divorce. And essentially what that means is it granted the dissolution of the marriage before other aspects of the divorce were resolved. So um, they didn't figure out any of the official custody stuff or the money or, you know, where, who gets the house. None of that was figured out. It was just the actual divorce. So, I mean, why would you do this? I, I'm assuming just so you could marry your girlfriend quicker, right? I mean, what else would be the point of an immediate divorce? Well, I mean, then too, it sounds like because he was hiding money and stuff like that, he was basically financially abusing Betty. That's what it sounds like. Oh, he was completely abusing her because he, you know, was telling the court like, oh, I, I'll give her this amount of money. But then he was not giving her the money or he would, he actually started like tailing how like every time you call, I'm going to take a thousand dollars off. And when you come into the house, I'm going to take $2,000 off. And if uh, you swear on the answering machine, that's $50. And so at one point she like actually owes a bunch of money. So he's doing all this stuff to her. And like, now he's refusing to pay for her lawyer um, and all these things saying like, well, I'm giving her money, but he's not, cause there's not a court order requiring him to. And the other thing she claims is like, Hey, you had me buy this expensive house. Um, you know, you made me buy all this, you know, not all of this expensive stuff, but you had me buy all this stuff. And then now you're not providing me enough money to actually support this lifestyle. They were accustomed to, you know, a, a lot of things that a lot of us probably aren't used to. Betty is she's really, she's in love with the coral reef house and she's fighting. She doesn't want them to sell the coral reef house. Um, and she's requesting this extreme amount of money for it. So like the house is worth like at this point, 350,000 and she's saying she wants a million or she's not selling. So Dan goes to court and basically says she's crazy and she's being unreasonable. And there's a court order that allows her to sell the house or I'm sorry, allows him to sell the house. And it's really important for him to sell this house because she keeps breaking in. He feels like maybe if I move to a new house, she's not going to feel as comfortable to just walk in and start totaling things. But when Betty gets the call from her lawyer saying, Hey, this got approved and Dan just sold your house. She was furious. She lost her mind and she got in her car and she actually drove like a big truck. She gets in her truck and she drives over to Dan's house and she, you know, she's pounding on the door. She's really mad at him. And he's like, get out of here. You have a restraining order. Like get off my property. I'm going to call the cops. So she gets back in her car and she runs the car into the front door of the house. And her kids are there at this time. Do you remember that part of the, the, the lifetime movie by chance? I do. I do. I feel like this was when she literally went ballistic. I mean, clearly she went ballistic prior to that, but this was one of the biggest scenes of the lifetime movie that I remember. And I remember the, the cops, they put her in a straight jacket and everything. Dan was like throwing around that he's a doctor and that she needs to be admitted and that she's crazy. 
Yeah. I remember that vividly. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was one of the parts that was like over the top, like that must, must've been a dramatization, but really that was all true. Like even Betty says they put her in a straight jacket in front of, in front of Dan's house and everything and had her removed from the property. And she ended up staying for three days. Uh, she was committed to, uh, like a psych ward. That would, I, I would think that that would be like a turning point, like being admitted, being arrested or whatnot, but it sounds like that wasn't the case for Betty. No, I agree. This should have been a wake up call, some sort of like turning point, but it just caused her to spiral more. She didn't like, she almost didn't take a break. Like she never had that moment of like, what am I doing? Like, I need to just move on with my life. She was just collapsing in all the shame and she felt like she was losing her identity. And Dan was really establishing himself and he was replacing her. And Linda, I mean, she just stepped in. She was going to all the same parties. Um, she was doing all the same. Betty felt like, you know, it clearly he just wanted to replace her. It wasn't that he was really unhappy with his life. He's not like taking up skydiving or something. He wants to do all the same stuff. He just wants to do it with like the younger version of Betty. How sad, (laughs) sad, sad, sad. It is sad. Eventually Betty will be sent to jail multiple times for ignoring these restraining orders. While Dan and Betty are making the newspaper um, for being called one of the worst divorces ever, Dan's also getting in the newspaper for proposing to Linda Kalkina. I mean, can you guess? I mean, Betty did not take this well. I mean, clearly she was very frustrated understandably. I mean, she's, she's lost her kids. She's lost her husband. Um, she's on the verge of a mental breakdown. She's feeling pinned to the wall. Um, and like, like nowhere, nowhere to go. She's, she's stuck. Yeah. I mean, I I'm sure she feels stuck and she claims that they're sending her like clippings from the news newspaper and with the announcement for the engagement and the courts and Linda accused Betty of sending them to herself. So again, either they're really messing with her and it's driving her crazy or she's going so crazy that she's mailing herself, um, like threatening letters. Okay. I like, there is so much going on right now. Can we, can we like recap a little bit? Because it seems like I'm, I'm trying to make sense. Are they divorced? but not divorced. Um, like they're always in court now. Like, is he officially already now married to Linda? No, that's okay. It's a good point. Let's slow down. So, so remember officially they are divorced on paper. They're, they're divorced, but they haven't split any of the assets. They haven't figured out the kids, any of that stuff. So they're still going to court constantly battling for things like alimony and, um, you know, all of this, just trying to work all of these details out. Betty's swearing it's impossible for her to get any kind of attorney to represent her. So, I mean, she's married to the head of the board, right? Or was, right? So what attorney in their right mind in California is going to represent her? Um, I I would sense that things are going to get even crazier now at this point. Because she, she has no representation. (laughs) So she's going to be on the forefront looking like a crazy person. Yeah. She has no understanding of the legal system and she's going to go ahead and do the craziest thing and represent herself. And in the court, she keeps trying to bring up the affair and show how, you know, you're taking all these things away from me because I'm crazy but this affair is what made me crazy. And they didn't want to hear it. They were like, this is not part of the divorce. You're not allowed to discuss it. So even though the custody battle is all around, whether or not Betty's crazy, she's not allowed to establish why she's angry. The battle just keeps going on. And eventually there was a ruling. So are you ready for this ruling? Yeah. So Betty was able to prove that Dan was hiding some money, but overall, it really was a big loss for her. She ended up with around $28,000 and Dan got custody of the kids 
And Betty was granted 16,000 a month in spousal support. $16,000 a what? A month. So a you month. Know, approximately 4,000 a week she was getting. And that's just in spousal support because she doesn't have full custody of the kids. That's I know. So, I mean, what? You're speechless. Wait, so this is, this is where we lose all the Betty supporters. I totally get it. I know. <laughs> I'm like, know. what? Uh, wait a second. Betty, Betty, Betty. $16,000 a month. Okay. okay. Things we would do for sixteen okay. a month. For real. But I do, I do, let's just put it into perspective a little. So she's going to get the 16,000 a month. And at this point, Dan's making around 157,000 a month. Okay. So she's getting chump change in comparison to what he's actually earning a month. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I can't even comprehend what making 157,000, like, I a month, say, like is right? that an error? Like that's what he's <laughs> making a year. And also this isn't, this isn't now, this is like the ni- early nineties. So I should have done the math on how much that is now. But there's a lot of money to make that's a month. A ridiculous amount of money. I mean, still even $16,000 a month is a ridiculous amount of money, but geez. Yeah. You think you'd be able to walk away and be satisfied with that amount of money. But, but again, if you're already bitter and upset with the whole situation, and then you're looking at how much she makes. And but then to too, to- it isn't that Betty just, I mean, like financially was <laughs> hindered by Dan. He took everything else away from her. So she, she felt like she had lost everything and granted. Yeah. Yeah money isn't the answer to everything, right? Like more money, more problems, but like it's, he stripped her of everything that she loved. He stripped her of himself. He took away the kids or she did it to herself, but like she was left with, with really $16,000 a month. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money, but it's, I could see it causing someone to lose their mind. If they lost everything else that they cared about, that they valued, you know, the sacrifices that she made for Dan and he just traded her in for a a younger model. (laughs) Yeah. And he's again, he's got full custody. He's letting her see that the kids, but that's sort of at his own discretion. And she's like, I have the 16,000 a month right now, but until when, like she knows that he's going to keep taking her back to court. He's going to keep trying to nickel and dime her. And, you know, she feels like she can't live her life because she knows he's like always right around the corner with another lawsuit. And she's playing his game too, because that, that is not her arena. Law is not her arena. That's Dan's arena. He's familiar with the law. He knows all the ins and outs and the red tape and how to work around things. So she's literally fighting a losing battle. Like there's just, (laughs) <laughs> there's no hope for Betty. Yeah. I think she's actually lost at this point. So, <laughs> so at this, and now what's going on is it's the big day. Dan and Linda are officially going to get married and Betty was furious about everything. I mean, she was mad that they're getting married on the same month that should have been their 20th wedding anniversary, which Ooh. yeah, seems like maybe <laughs> they were just trying to poke the bear a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. That's an understatement. And remember when I said that the morning dress was going to come back? Yeah. So of course for his wedding to Linda, that's what he decided to wear to the wedding. Oh my gosh. I'm sure that that just drove. Well, I mean, Betty, did she know? I mean, I'm sure she did. And that probably drove her insane. But I do yeah. remember you saying this was going to come back up. Yeah, because I mean, she was asking her daughters for all the details and, and things like that. Uh, and she was just really upset because it was like, hey, you wouldn't do it for me, but you'll do it for her. And th- and there was other weird things like they honeymooned in almost the same area. It was yeah, it was like, again, it's it's Betty's life. Just insert Linda. Dan's he was so intentional about 
how he played this out. It's so, so clear. Yeah. Yes, it's very clear. And Linda ends up accusing Betty of stealing the guest list. And one day when she's dropping off the kids, she thinks she just swiped the guest list. And Betty accuses Linda of stealing her journal. So there's a lot of like, she said, he said, going back and forth. And Dan and Linda were really trying to plan their wedding and they, they get confirmation that Betty's bought a gun. So I think, you know, obviously when somebody's calling you and leaving messages saying they're going to kill you, I, I actually think it can go one or two ways. I think Linda was really starting to get concerned and wanted to do something about it. I mean, she actually asked for them to like hire security. Um, Dan's family wanted him to wear a bulletproof vest uh, and all these things. And I think Dan's like, nobody is crazy enough to leave a message on your answering machine saying that they're going to kill you and then show up and kill you. So he, I mean, he really thought she wasn't a threat. He also thought like, she's never going to kill the cash cow. She needs me. She needs my money. She's not going to mess that up. Can you imagine having to wear a bulletproof vest on your wedding day? (laughs) Or even the thought of thinking that someone, your ex-wife or ex-husband is going to come and murder you at your wedding? I mean, it has to really put a damper on the wedding. Definitely. And he ended up- The whole relationship, if you ask me. if If I'm Linda, I'm like, dude, this is just too much- is is she's too extra you know you're antagonizing her like it's too much oh but you forgot remember he makes 157 thousand oh yeah 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 <laughs> that that could be a game changer <laughs> <laughs> linda's like just put a bulletproof vest on we're getting down this aisle but he actually ends up not wearing the bulletproof vest they did hire security and they took that added precaution of warning all of their guests that betty's crazy and could try to show up So basically like alert the security. If you see my crazy ex-wife Betty, which I think again, you're just fueling that conversation. Like my ex-wife is so crazy. Like Betty's so crazy. Watch out for Betty. Um, you know, (laughs) I don't blame them though. Yeah. Dan, he did an amazing job of getting the word out that Betty is crazy. Yeah. Luckily Betty did not show up to the wedding. I don't know if she just had like that moment where she was like, okay, you really can't be that crazy. Or if it was because her friends were watching her because she did have some family friends sit with her and they like even had strategies for if she got away from them. So it's again, it's when you're, when your close friends are concerned, you're going to show up and try to kill him. That's definitely, definitely cause for, for let's like, let's pause. Let's analyze the situation. (laughs) Should she be hospitalized again? But you know how that goes. Yeah. Mm. Betty was still spiraling into just declining mental health and she's constantly being threatened to be sent back to jail. Her friends just don't know what to do anymore. You know, they say Betty is really just like a shell of what she used to be. And her family wants nothing to do with her. They say she's just like, she's shaming the family. They're considering her a total embarrassment. And at this time, Dan still got full custody But Betty would get them, you know, like every other weekend that arrangement started to occur. And then Dan started playing head games again with the kids. So he would, you know, plan trips or something, say like, Hey, do you want to take the kids this weekend? Um, Do you want to, you know, have some extra time with them during the week? And she would be all excited. And then he would up and change his mind and say, Oh, never mind, You can't have the kids. He would, uh, he would do this all the time. Last second. And in 89, he agreed that Betty could have the kids over Easter. So she's so excited. You know, she's buying all the Easter baskets. She's like got the bunny ears on and everything. She's all ready for the weekend. She bought a bunch of food and she's going to go to the school that day to go pick them up because she promised she would get there early. She'd get them from school. And when she gets there, she sees that they're already in Dan's car And apparently he's changed his mind. That's how he's telling her, like literally he's in his car, pulling away with her kids and is like, sorry, changed my mind. So strategic. He, he really put an already depressed 
and defeated person in a bad frame of mind. Um, he, he pretty much, he pushed her into that frame of mind for sure. That's a yeah. horrible thing to do to someone. Yeah. And I just feel like it's so much worse on a holiday and now you've planned for it. You have all the decorations up. You're ready for a celebration and you have to come back home alone. I mean, just and put I'm, her in a really bad mind frame. And I'm sure her kids wanted to see her too. So it wasn't just Dan being, you know, I, just horrible to Betty out of spite. But he was all, that's a horrible thing to do to the kids too. You know, yeah, because they're crying. They wanted to go with their mom. They were really upset. And Dan told, you know, he told their sons, I, I want to let you go see your mom, but you know, she's dangerous. She's acting crazy. You know, you need to tell her she needs to stop calling and threatening me and Linda and swearing on the answering machine. And, and, you know, then we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll let you go see her. So yeah, obviously that's messed up. You're, you're clearly playing the kids against each other. And this is the, like, I, I'm like about to tear up. This is the part of the story that just like broke my heart. Cause I listened to the full call, but Betty ends up calling there to talk to her sons. And of course, Dan's recording this the whole time. And so at this point, her son is begging her, please, mom, please stop calling and swearing. And he's begging her. He says, you know, I just want to come see you and you won't stop calling Linda all these horrible names. He asked her why, you know, why did she care about, about Linda and their family so much? She needed to just shut her mouth and get over it and move on. And the boys wanted to live with her. So she was like, you know, it was clear to her son, Danny, like that she was the one causing them to not be able to live there. And he was pleading with her. And this call lasted for 46 minutes. And she just starts getting really mean. And she says, you've been there too long. She's yelling at him saying, you know, you're just taking her, their side. And I mean, at this way, the kids, I mean, the kids even realize she's not being rational, but I mean, Betty's reaction was, I mean, honestly, it was toxic. It was abusive. She accused Danny of living there for too long and taking his dad's side. And she like, she lost it on him and she hung the phone up. I'm just going to say, I mean, it was really heartbreaking. That's horrible. And it it is heartbreaking. Like I, I'm feeling a little bit emotional. You know, I just, I feel like Betty, she had lost her mind. She had, she had really checked out. Um, and then too, maybe she felt like, well, I can't hurt Dan for what he's done to me. And her kids were next in line, maybe not in- intentionally, but like, you know, she, she had lost all control. It sounds like. Yeah. I think that the calling was almost it like had become an addiction. So, I mean, it was hard for, especially her young sons. I think anybody to understand like why she couldn't stop calling. Um, but I think she really legitimately couldn't stop calling. Like it was just a part of her routine at this point. She was addicted. She was addicted, um, in trying to make Dan's life and Linda's life as uncomfortable as possible. And although, you know, she may or may not have been successful the out, the, the end all be all was just heartbreaking. Cause now these kids they're without parents. It's sad. Well, on that, do you want to get into the final night? Yeah. Let's hear about what happened. So what did Miss Betty do? <laughs> what did Miss Betty do? So things were starting to calm down and the kids really did want to live with her. So Betty was using all of her money to get a lawyer and fight for like for custody. She wanted that agreement amended. And Betty was a good mom. And I think Dan knew that he was really, it was just getting harder to fight this and it wasn't good for the kids anyway. So he started more and more letting, letting the kids go over there, uh, specifically the boys. So the girls are actually, I mean, they're older, they have their own apartments at this point, but the boys want to go stay over there when, so that final night, 
both of her sons are there and Dan sends her a letter from the lawyer, just letting her know that basically they made it clear that Betty will never have her kids back and that her life as she knows it is over. So, I mean, he belittles her lawyer I mean, makes her lawyer sound stupid. And this is heartbreaking for Betty. It's just like another, another court battle. Same, you know, same, same old story. Here he goes again, just controlling her life. And so Betty can't sleep. She's up all night. She's reading this letter over and over again. And then she packs her gun and she pulls out her daughter's keys that she'd stolen for about a month earlier. Wait a second. You've got to be kidding me. She used her daughter's keys. I mean, what? Yeah. Um, so I'm sure her daughters didn't process that well, finding out that the way that their mother gained access to their father's home to murder them using their freaking keys. Yeah, losing those keys, it was a really big deal for Kim because. Her, I mean, obviously her dad was always like, do not lose those keys. And so when she lost them, allegedly, she searched for them for hours and Betty's helping her. They're searching all over. And this whole time, Betty had the keys and she had just hit them from Kim. And like, I don't, I don't I'm not sure how Kim moved. And maybe she didn't move on from that. I mean, that had to have been hard. I'd say that's pretty unforgiving. Yeah, I think that's fair. So it's around 5 a.m. It's still dark. It's uh, November 5th, 1989. And she claims that she just wanted to talk some sense into them and that if they weren't going to listen, she was going to just shoot herself right there because she couldn't she couldn't do this anymore. So she enters the house and she walks right up to the room that they're in. So she enters their bedroom and she says that Dan moved and she panicked and she didn't know what happened, but the gun went off five times. So Linda was shot once in the head and once in the chest, but she died instantly. And Dan was shot in the chest and he tried to get up. So Betty pulled the phone out of the wall and she actually took it with her and dropped it when she was leaving the room. So she also claims that the last thing Dan said was, okay, you shot me. I'm dead. And Dan survives for over a half an hour before he finally chokes on his own blood. Betty, again, she drops the phone as she's starting to leave so that he can't call, you know, he can't call for any help. And then as soon as she leaves, she goes to a pay phone and she starts calling her friends and her family, like first thing in the morning. And she's just saying, I did it. I did it. I killed him. So do you want to guess who found the bodies? Please don't tell me it was the kids. Please don't tell me that it was the kids. No, they were home alone because their mom went out to kill their dad, but oh they thankfully God. were not the ones that found him. So it was Bradley Wright. Who was that? Who's Bradley Wright? Oh, you don't know? That's Betty's boyfriend. So all this time, this heifer has a boyfriend and she's tripping and acting crazy over Dan and she's already got a new boo. Not a new boo. She's been dating this guy for years, but She was embarrassed because he's six years younger than her. And she feels like, you know, that's somehow like the equivalent of, you know, Dan dating someone half his age. Like she thinks it's embarrassing and he can't support her the way that Dan could. She didn't want anyone to really know about him, but he was there all the time. It was a really big part of her life. So this changes my view entirely. And it really makes me feel as though this was all just obsession at this point for Betty. Like she was just, it didn't matter if Dan took her back and Dan broke up with Linda. She was just obsessed with terrorizing them. Yeah. She was obsessed with it. I also don't understand like how, how could her boyfriend be okay with this? Like at at some point, aren't you like, okay, we get it. Like, you know, I don't know. I feel like I would want to move on, but he did kind of defend her. He said they were never able to go on vacations or anything like that because he would pull like pull the shit where he was like, well, do you want to see the kids? So she would never want to leave the house. Like she would want to wait by the phone and hope that he would let her see her kids. So, uh, I mean, what kind of relationship was it really anyways, you know? Right. I mean, this, I still wonder 
was Dan still like kind of playing into Betty, you know, like show giving her a little bit of hope here and there. Um, because if he, if he was doing that, like she's trying to, to do things or carry on with her life. And then he's like, no, no, no. I want you to still continue to give me attention and still be mad and, you know, still try and attack me. Like, like, was he obsessed with that too? You know, does that make sense? Yeah. I, I mean, we've, we've already said it. I do think that it wasn't it all, it wasn't all one-sided. I do think they were definitely antagonizing her. So I think that, you know, he just wanted her to sit at home and cry and, you know, wish and Dan was still over there. Him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He couldn't imagine her moving on. So I mean, she did spend a lot of time trying to ruin his life though. So So obviously at this point now, Betty's going back to jail and she'll be heading to court, which is, I think, practically her favorite place now because she spends a (laughs) lot of time there. And almost immediately, Betty becomes famous. Like she's almost a hero for battered women. You know, a lot of women have suffered from powerful husbands, especially at this time. And she says she's getting around 60 letters a day. And in these letters there's including like gifts and money and um just all sorts of stuff i mean women are just saying like thank you i I mean apparently betty is not the only woman who has supported her husband and her family and then gotten left behind so a lot of a lot of sympathizing people and because of this the first trial ended up in a hung jury so (laughs) members of the i I'm sorry. Did you just give me like a really shocked look? Were you surprised it was hung jury? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, what more evidence was needed at this point? I mean, what, what was it? What was it based off of? Why was it a hung jury? <laughs> well, members of the jury said that they felt they did feel that she was provoked and they didn't like Dan. I mean, nobody likes lawyers, but they thought that uh, she should have been allowed to please self-defense. So that was one of the big reasons they didn't want to move forward. And one of them was quoted saying, I don't know how she didn't do it sooner. So, <laughs> jaded yeah. woman, jaded woman. Um, no, I mean, think about it too. Like I, I, I could, I could say that that's a relatable statement of like, what took you so long? Because this took years for her to work up to do, to like act this out and perform this action. But there were so many other things he had done prior to that that would have driven anyone to, you know, that type of madness. Right. And so now they're going to, again, they have to go back to court. We got to go to a second trial and Betty's really optimistic, but her lawyer's really concerned. You know, he says the prosecutor is not going to want to lose again. They're going to do everything possible. They know everything you're going to say. And they're, they're coming with their a game. So he's, really worried. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, it was basically the same trial just with different jurors. So it was the same lawyers and they were aggressive. I mean, they really came after Betty in this trial. Well, I'm sure these are Dan's friends, right? The prosecutors are his lawyer buddies and, and friends. They're coming for revenge. Like you've killed our friend we are, we're coming for you. Well, I think it's that. And I think Betty made him look stupid. She got away with it. Well, I mean, she didn't get away because she has to go back, but I mean, they weren't able to prove her guilty. So, I mean, they were doing like, they were coming prepared to take her down. And I think again, Betty's just being naive and thinks like, well, people love me and it's all going to work out for me. But in the end, it doesn't. And so she testified in both trials and in this one, she, she slipped up a little more. And I guess in the first trial, they actually forgot to ask her about the the phone and ripping the phone out of the wall. So in the second one, I mean, that shows a lot more intent. So she got charged with second degree murder and was sentenced to 32 years to life. Was the first charge that she got in the hung jury, was it also second degree murder? What do you mean? Like, is that what they were trying to charge her with? Yeah. Yes, they were trying. Yeah, they were trying to get around second degree murder and it was a hung jury in the first one. Okay. So in this trial, a lot of the jury said that they 
they were really unhappy with the sentence, to be honest. They thought she was guilty, but they thought she deserved more like 10 years. And they admitted that that phone call with their son, because I I'm telling you guys, if you want a good cry, look this phone call up. Um, but listening to that, that just took him over the edge. And that's what made him go ahead and in convict her and say she was guilty, but they, they didn't think she deserved 32 years to life. They were shocked. They really didn't know it was going to be anything near that, but the judge really thought there was evidence to show that, you know, she, I mean, she packed the gun, she went over there and then pulling that phone out of the wall, really to him just showed intent. Betty was eligible for parole recently, but she still shows no remorse. So she's still in jail. I mean, still to this day, she cannot like, she still like, is like, I mean, I, yes, I'm sorry. I did it, but they made me like, she just can't say I'm so sorry. Like she really can't. Um, she's, I think she's still convinced that if she can tell you every little thing Dan did to her, then you will understand. And like, you you'll fight for her. You'll do anything you can to get her out of jail. Cause she doesn't think she should be held guilty. Betty hasn't changed is what I get from that. I mean, remorse is, is one thing, but she, that hatred for Dan and Linda is still seems like it's present. Like <laughs> that hasn't subsided just because they're no longer alive. She's still really pissed off about what the fuck he did. Yeah. I mean, yeah, she's still really pissed off. And some interesting facts that I found about the case that I just kind of have to share with you. Cause I think it shows that Dan's petty too. Dan's estate was only split between three of the four kids because their second daughter Lee was removed from the will. Petty. <laughs> petty. Yeah. Cause Lee was the one who was really close with her mom and would defend her mom. And Dan got pissed and removed her from the will. So now she was left without and like without either of her parents and left without any money, but the, um, three out of the four children now live in Idaho and only Dan, the uh, oldest son still lives in California, but from all appearances, they are doing great. They're still happy. They still talk to each other, which I think could be really hard because they are split in the middle. Two of them actually testified against their mom and two of them testified for their mom. I and mean, that's, that's like a hard thing to still come around the the dinner table at Christmas over. Was it, this was it the daughters were more supportive of their mom and the sons were more supportive of their dad or vice versa or mixed? No, it's mixed. So, um, Kim and Dan, the oldest, uh, like the oldest daughter and the oldest son both testified against her. And then, uh, Lee and Rhett, the younger, the younger daughter and the younger son were for her. And they're, they're trying to get her out of jail. Lee even said she, if she got out of jail, she could come stay with her. I mean, again, Kim, I mean, she used Kim's key, so I could see her being really bitter and they all, especially the older kids have really vivid memories of some of these things that she did to him. I mean, like Dan never forgot about the phone call with her, with his mom. So, and Kim still to this day swears that like some of the stuff that Betty was saying was just crazy and it wasn't true. I will say though, like the kids might not have been getting the full picture either. She's also was older when they started the divorce. You know, when you're 16, you're not all up in your parents' business. You know, you just want to go hang out with your friends. Right. No, that makes sense. Not that I feel like Betty deserves anybody defending her right now. (laughs) So I mentioned it before after Betty, after her marriage ended, she began dating this businessman, Bradley T. Wright. And so, you know, so I mentioned that she was embarrassed and she didn't really want people to know about their relationship because he was younger, but they were together for a number of years. And the reason like I really found out about him was he had letters from her in like, you know, do you ever watch like storage wars? Yeah. Yeah. So he had this storage unit and in the storage unit, he had these letters that um, were back and forth, like letters from her. And in there, there was also check stubs that showed he had sent her three checks. So two of them were $2,000 and one of them were for $1,000. And in them, she's like still yelling at him because he won't send her more money because she needs to get her teeth fixed. So (laughs) I just think it's funny. Like you're so embarrassed of him. He can't take care of you, but he's the one who actually like managed the selling of her house and like 
took care of all of her assets when she went to jail and you know, now he's, now you need him to get your teeth fixed and stuff. So, um, <laughs> Betty. yeah, but so he lost the storage unit said he completely forgot those letters were in there. And so someone bought the storage unit for like a hundred bucks and then they go in there and they find these letters from Betty Broderick. And so it ended up in the news and stuff. And I was like, could you imagine being Betty? Like he cares about me that little. He didn't even remember my stuff was sitting in a storage unit. Whoever bought the storage unit hit a lick too, because I'm sure they got um, some type, some form of payment for releasing the letters that, that were in there. Right. That would be I'm my sure. guess. Something, <laughs> you know, all that stuff goes for, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll yeah. share them later, but I have uh, letters from the night soccer. So when we cover the night soccer, I'll show those. And those were not cheap. Like there's a weird market for this stuff and, <laughs> and I'm one of them. <laughs> I did want to end on, on a Linda note. <laughs> I really wanted to end and just sort of mention Linda Kalkina, because to be honest, when I first recalled the case, I didn't even remember that Dan had a new wife and I didn't remember she was murdered. Like I, I've just spent hours talking about Betty Broderick and I, I mean, I keep talking about the affair, but I mean, we don't really know anything about Linda herself and she was murdered. It is sad. And it's something that a lot of her friends have complained about too, is there's like all these memorials every year, but in them, they really just talk about Dan and you know, that that's not fair. You know, she was a victim and I actually remember. So the first time I really heard about the story was in 2010. This was back when Betty was up for parole And I remember hearing um, when I heard about Linda and I heard that she was 20 and she was trying to get in between, you know, this couple and she's pursuing this millionaire. I remember being like, get it, Linda, like, (laughs) because I was like 20. So I I totally got that. And then like re-listening, I was like, she's a monster. Like I being, you know, closer to Betty's age when this happened. Um, So I think like a lot of people have just painted her as this villain. And the one thing that I do want to say is, you know, if we're being honest, she was only 20 and Dan was her boss and he's like a millionaire. And I just think if the situation happened today, a lot of people would have a lot more questions, you know, it would be less about the affair and, you know, is Dan abusing his power? I mean, if we remember, if you recall, like one of Betty's first dates with him, when he like pulls her over to the side of the road and tells her like, this is how it's going to be. I mean, potentially that's also what Linda was going through. I mean, I, hopefully they really were happy and, you know, that their marriage was real and it was great, but I think maybe we shouldn't all just hate on Linda, even though she's the pretty young receptionist. (laughs) So, you know, friends say, friends said that she was really funny and she was super kind. Like she was the type of person who was like, oh, your car's broken down. Like, come take mine. And she would let friends come stay with her and use anything they needed. Um, She was, you know, she was super friendly and super helpful. And when I was looking for pictures of her, I honestly, this is, this is disgusting, but I found more of her body than I found of her herself. So, um, yeah, I feel like she's sort of, you know, she's like just this victim now, but nobody thinks of her as a victim. And I mean, her life ended at 28. I mean, just think of all the things you didn't even know at 28. I just think, again, I think we should just take a little more time to, I don't want to say appreciate Linda, but Linda was a real person and uh, we can't just forget about her. I think that that's a good note to end on for sure. Like you said, she definitely was a victim too. And although she was young, her, the last part of her twenties was basically chaos. Yeah. Yeah chaos, whether it was, you know, back and forth, tit for tat, it was still just chaotic. And yeah, then very. She, and then she gets murdered. So she definitely was a victim. So where's your stance on Betty now? <laughs> I, I have switched it up. Betty. I mean, it's relatable. Don't get me wrong. It's mm-hmm. everything that she went through, everything that Dan did. Um, And again, two, there are two sides to every story. Dan's not here to give his side, but from what I gathered from Betty's stance, she 
you know, was a jaded woman, but she was still wrong. She still murdered two people and her family is completely destroyed. Yeah. And she doesn't seem to really acknowledge that still. I I don't think that she's capable of acknowledging that. Yeah. And I think that's why it's, I can't, I can't be team Betty just because she's still so bitter. She can't get over it. She doesn't seem to really recognize and understand how this really ruined a lot of people's lives and in her own children. I mean, it really ruined her children's lives and I don't know. She doesn't seem to really want to own up to it. So that was the Betty Broderick case. I thought you did wonderfully. Thank you. I am honestly very excited to not think about Betty Broderick for a while. It has been over a month (laughs) of constantly studying her. I mean, I literally went to the house. (laughs) I couldn't have like entered her life any more than I did. So happy to be moving on, but thank you again, everyone so much for listening. We really hope you enjoyed it. And please rate and review us. Uh, It's very important to us. A thousand miles of crime podcast, all fives, please. And please tell your friends. It'll really help us out. Thanks for listening, everyone.